also welcome all our distinguished panelists and of course all our registrants here this evening. The purpose of today's webinar is to create an awareness as to how industries in both Australia and India will be realigning their strategies in manufacturing post COVID-19. So this means we're going to look at highlighting emerging opportunities for making India, for Australian industries, and new opportunities for Indian businesses in Australia. And also in that context to update on government policies aligned to the new outlook in manufacturing. So without further ado, I'd like to invite and just uh, invite Bish, who is our national uh, chapter chair on Make in India. And can I just draw to your attention on the screen, all our panelists will be on the screen. And so we've got Bish, who will be coming up very shortly. We have Preeti, President of Victoria, Grant of AIBC. We have Julian, who is the chair of the Parliamentary Friends of India. We have the Honourable Manish Gupta, who is the Consul General of India, Sydney. We have the Honourable Deepak Bhatta, who is there from India. We have Michael Sharp. We have Cam and Ruth. We have Manish Singh from Fiki. Great to be there. We have Claire as our International Engagement Manager for Standards Australia. Now, all of these CVs will be on the screen very shortly. And I should like now to invite Vish, our National Chair for Make in India, to speak on Make in India and launch Make in India here. Vish, over to you. Thank you, National Chair, Mr. Jim Burgess. Welcome all the panelists. All our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. This is what Walt Disney, pioneer of the American animation industry said. Make in India is a dream project for Honorable Narendra Modi ji, Prime Minister of India. When he launched this project in 2014, he had a vision that Make in India is not only good for India, but also for the other countries globally. It is with that vision when this was launched, more than 170 countries participated in this project. When this, it was proposed that Make in India project will be useful to Australia, the Australia India Business Council very much supported this idea. And then we, we launched this, this Make in India, India chapter in, in 2019. Basically, Make in India objective is to encourage manufacture in India for products and services. Apart from manufacturing, value for money, supply chain, innovation is an added benefit. There are a lot of other advantages. Make in India has got 25 sectors, but for the purpose of Australian market, we have identified five sectors, which are electric vehicles, energy management, including storage battery technologies, sports, food processing, health, pharmaceuticals, and services, which include manufacturing services, the topic of the discussion today. We have identified a number of projects within Australia. We are creating an awareness of this Make in India in other states as well. We'll be encouraging business to business and business to government connections. We have a number of examples of success stories. MedSearch, which is a 100% Australian company, has invested in the Indian manufacturing site, which is sterile injectables product. Similarly, we have Tritium Technology in, based in Queensland. They are into manufacturing the battery chargers for electric vehicles. We have four more ex number of examples. Basically, this is a win-win situation for the Australian companies. Without much ado, I invite the National Chair Jim Borges to launch with me the Make in India chapter activities for Victoria. The Victorian chapter is led by Preeti Daga, and please give a very big hand to Preeti. Thanks, 
Thanks very much, uh, Bish. And, and uh, without further ado, we hereby launch the Make in India initiative here in Victoria. And what a great introduction to Prithi, who is our president in Victoria and with a lot of energy. And she's also represented organizations like the AFL Cricket Australia and Bully Zero Foundation. So Prithi, over to you. Thanks again, Jim. Um, and uh, I missed the initial part, but I'm sure everyone was warmly welcomed. Um, so uh, to the fellow panelists and our attendees from India and Australia, on behalf of the big chapter, I just like to say how delighted I am to be here and also to see the launch of the Make in India focus chapter in the state. I'd just like to share some of the descriptors being used in Australia in relation to India. Fastest growing economy, dynamic, powerful friend, major trading partner, natural ally. These are just some of the words that are used to describe India here. And to me, these highlight the importance India is accorded in Australia's bilateral relationships with other countries. I think we can all agree, and I've just heard Julian say that same thing, that India would be an even more important uh, to Australia in the post-COVID world as it looks to diversify its investments and increase its trade with countries other than India's neighbor. I'm certain the sentiment is shared on the other side and I'm looking forward to hearing from the panelists in a while. Now, this is no hidden fact that Australia's relationship with India is expanding rapidly in breadth and in depth. India is uh, already Australia's fourth largest export market, second largest source of overseas students and largest source of skilled migration to Australia. Well, within this, uh, the state of Victoria, of course, plays a key role in the bilateral relationship. Victoria is home to Australia's largest Indian diaspora, has the largest number of university partners with India, hosts half of the total Indian student population. That's why the Victorian government prepared the Victoria's India strategy, our shared future in 2018, which was further complemented by the federal government's India economic strategy to 2035, delivered by Peter Varghese. Now, the major difference in both the reports was the Victoria strategy was a blueprint for 10 years, while the federal strategy provided a roadmap for boosting this relationship over the next two decades. But both the reports identified key sectors and Indian states that Australia should focus on. Now, a lot has been said already, and a lot will hear those about the sectors. Uh, on the top is, of course, education, agriculture, energy, resource, healthcare, to name a few. Now, Indian government reciprocated by preparing an Australia economic strategy uh, led by Ambassador Anil Vadba, which highlighted the potential to collaborate and partner in several sectors. So I'd like to acknowledge the Indian government's strong reform agenda under the uh, leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi that has opened India to record levels of foreign investment. Uh, with an ambition to make it a manufacturing hub for the world, it seems more likely to be a reality now. The recent spate of policy initiatives in the manufacturing sector are a step, I think, in that direction. Now, this presents a significant economic opportunity for both the countries, and I'd like to highlight some for Victoria. Victoria's knowledge and expertise in education, health, food, sport, transport, infrastructure, water management is known to the whole world. In many areas, India is breaking new ground by innovation and advances in health and medical technology. I think Victoria can learn a lot from India about innovation, entrepreneurship, and smart manufacturing. Indian states like Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, Maharashtra, name a few are some of the solid manufacturing hubs, and I'm sure we'll hear more about them uh, from the other panelists. Uh, many Victorian companies have already taken the opportunity to avail these by setting up manufacturing facilities uh, as an opportunity to scale up, to expand their operations, uh, and to increase their global competitiveness. Uh, we have one such Victorian healthcare company on the panel. Uh, they're also in the committee uh, of Victoria chapter, and I'm looking forward to hearing their experience uh, and their market insight. Well, some of the other businesses that are successfully set up, manufacturing based in India, Lipcoin Avas Group, they manufacture rechargeable batteries for vehicles and a vast of other clean energy products. Another company to name is Orica, that has set up manufacturing in India, is now the world's largest provider of commercial vehicles and creative blasting systems. There are many that I can cite examples of uh, that have used the opportunity to really go global. Uh, 
uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Now, finally, what role does AIBC Victoria play? Uh, the big management committee or the chapter is, a, is part of the AIBC national team, uh, made up of very strong, diverse team of seven members. We connect business, we provide in market support through India network and industry partners such as Fiji. We provide information, market insights, and facilitate partnerships. And now with the establishment of a Make in India focus chapter, we're going to be actively encouraging our members to look at India and facilitate those connections and the partnerships between Victorian businesses in India. And I would like to say that Invest India is going to be a major, major stakeholder in that. So I'm really delighted they are on the panel. I'm looking forward to what we have to share. In summary, I'd just like to say that India's expanding economy, its smart manufacturing know-how and, and well-integrated supply chain infrastructure and, and a robust middle class is a lucrative market for certain businesses, one that should be an integral part of their growth strategy. Thank you. Thanks, Preeti. And let's, uh, let's go to Julian, Julian Lisa, who is well known in Australia as someone who has represented the I India and Indian connections really well. So, Julian, I'll ask you without further ado to give, share us your perspective. Well, thanks so much, Jim. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful as a New South Welshman to be at the board of these Victorian uh, uh, um, can I do and can I acknowledge Vish and can I also acknowledge my good friend Manish Gupta, who's doing a wonderful job representing India. I think actually both countries are so well represented in their opposite. Uh, with Manish in uh, uh, New South Wales and the ACT and uh, Gitesh Sharma, Barry O'Farrell uh, in Delhi. Uh, I have been in touch with almost daily at the moment on Australia-India issues. I just think we're very lucky at both levels with the diplomatic representation. Now, I was in India, I should say, at the very beginning of the year of the week when the Prime Minister's trip to India and to reacquaint myself with some of the issues that are there in the Australia-India relationship. And can I say, but a wonderful demonstration of the importance of Australia to India I was there during the Australian bushfire crisis. So many Indians from the Chai Walla who was serving the tea, similar to the MEA, were expressing their sympathy to worries about the lives and the uh, animals. But that seems a long time ago. strong interest in seeing speed and we've got ambitious plans to grow um, the manufacturing sector. As you know, uh, everyone in this audience will know that's the strategy set an ambitious with the focus on 10 key sectors and 10 key states. With India as one of our top three trading partners and direct investment growing to $100 billion. Our two largest exports to India provide really crucial exports to India's members. The success of making India directly contribute to the success of our own economic development. We also um, welcome the greater integration of regional and global value chains, companies which share such important common values. Values based on democracy, the promotion of the preservation of an open Our investments are already making a significant contribution to India manufacturing. The success of the Tata Blue Scott Steel Scott Venture between two of our major com companies in each company is a, it underscores, I think, the vast potential of the Australian Australia Peru, where it makes decisions in the aircraft for both Bowie and Hockey Obviously, as I, as I said, COVID-19 has a significant effect on manufacturing. When I think our own manufacturing, it's great to see the way um, a range of manufacturers have stepped up to make different products to meet the market. So hand sanitizer or uh, 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 other medical equipment. And then <coughs> I've been impressed to see how our businesses are 
can demonstrate that they can be agile, keep production going and keep people working. If we undertake the planning for the recovery phase, we'll be looking to issue recovery, what that means for the current industry. I know in India's case, Prime Minister Modi spoke about the need for reform and liquidity and laws to assist this Indian recovery. And I know the Indian government, like our own, has got a quite substantial um, stimulus to fix activity. Now, while things in the post COVID world might look different, we will continue to our open economy to work with food in India, promote our free trade and our rich. Stable and open global trading system with a fit supply chain to innovate. And crucial to the global effort to fight Our India Indo Pacific region remains stable, prosperous, sovereign, cooperative, shared. Now more than ever, it's important that we support our vision for the region, promoting rules and laws to provide support. Regional economic integration based uh, on, uh, uh, on RCEP, I think it's important that we will continue to encourage India's participation. We respect it's India's decision as to whether to join RCEP or not. Can, can people still hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yep. Um, uh, we, we, we respect it's the decision there, but we want to keep the door open to, to India. Uh, look, uh, finally, I just wanted very quickly to refer to, I won't read out the whole letter that uh, Minister Birmingham has given me um, for the purpose of today. Uh, he very much regrets not being here uh, to celebrate this very important launch and reflected on the fact that uh, he was in India in February too. It must have been one of the very last overseas trips he did, uh, leading a mission of 119 delegates from 87 businesses. And no doubt there'll be people who were involved in his mission uh, here uh, the fame today, and relevantly for Victoria, your Minister Martin Pakula, as well as Stuart Ayres from New South Wales, went with him. The Australia India Business Exchange went across six cities delivering tailored programs on education, infrastructure, the built environment, premium Australian food, wine, health, beauty, and resources. Businesses continue to pursue opportunities coming out of that, uh, and uh, businesses and the government are committed to building a strong commercial relationship with their partners in India. Um, the, one of the examples given is Tourism Australia's uh, desire to tap into as things are, uh, open up again uh, in India's great potential tourism market. Um, he ha he's had a very productive exchange with uh, Piyush Goyal, the Minister for Commerce and Industry, as part of his recent joint ministerial meeting, and the full extent of commercial outcomes will emerge in time. But we think, as Australia, that the relationship remains promising. I'll just read now his final paragraph in conclusion. The COVID-19 pandemic has not changed the fundamentals and is only likely to accelerate them. Apart from our strong education and tourism partnerships, Australia will continue to be a trusted supplier of raw materials to fuel India's economic recovery, including to drive manufacturing. That's an important contribution Australia can make to the Make in India story, whether it be our strong metallurgical coal exports, our energy commodity, wool exports, or our expertise in mining services and technology. And he concludes, I wish you all the best for your launch and look forward to the Simon Birmingham. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Judy, and that's excellent. Um, and now let's move to Sydney with uh, uh, Manish Gupta, Consul General of India. And uh, he's been very active in, in promoting the Make in India message uh, in New South Wales. Over to you, uh, Manish. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Jumbergis, a national chair for AIBC. Indeed, a privilege, you know, for me to connect with all of you after a while. It has been very difficult, uncertain times for all of us. But probably, I think this is the first or second such meeting you know I'm having in the last one week or so. I'm really delighted, you know, Vish is there, PC, you are there, and we are launching the meeting in this chapter. Nothing could be better than this. Only important is my friends from India all have joined, and it's really good. Mr. Deepak Bagla is here, so we can really focus on some of the good things which have come up recently in the Prime Minister's announcements. And above all, 
a chair of India Australia Parliament Council, Mr. Julian Lee. Our dear friend is here. Probably you couldn't ask for a move. We have another good friend of India as High Commissioner in Delhi. Both the Prime Ministers, as we all know, they have excellent chemistry. I think all the political environment, we, we couldn't ask something for better than this. I'm asked to just focus on the case side of the thing. So what I would try to just deeply focus on, you know, what are the opportunities that are there in front of us? Because our trade statistics, because all of us are India, Australia watchers, we know it's a whole thing comes from a very low trade base. And as I always said, at this stage, balance of trade doesn't matter beyond the point, you know. But what is more important is people you refer to and come and read are also a pharma and healthcare space. I think this is one of the big factors, especially in the post COVID environment. And as Mr. Lisa is there, one thing I would like to point out, you know, especially in the generics medicine space, Australia's market is a lot more regulated. In the United States, you have almost 50% of generics permitted. In Denmark, 70%. But in Australia, it is less than 50%. So the regulators really need to think about it a little bit. It will open up the market, bring down the prices for the Australian consumers. And of course, we'll have a lot more opportunities also in the healthcare systems. I'm not saying it's one way, it will be different, you know, as we go forward. Second thing, you know, we should also, so far we have never discussed it beyond the point, but we should also look to focus on the defense and defense sector. Austria is looking forward to diversify in its strategic business environment. India, very recently, some of you, we have already seen, you know, we have permitted FDI up to 74% in the defense space. We are also unregulating it. And probably, you know, the manufacturing levels of both the countries we are in, there's a lot of opportunity for cooperation in, in the intermediate production space. And it's a huge market and it builds capacities at both times. Especially when Australia is looking in terms of the advanced manufacturing, and India, you know, of course, the focus will continue in the low, medium, and the all regions of this platform. Mining is one sector which has not been transactional. Also. But probably when we talk about the renewables and all rare earths and minerals, it's a good opportunity, you know, for Australian firms to look into India for the development, and the Indian firms also have a great opportunity in this country. One sector I was always fascinated with, and I would once again like to point it out, is the startup space. This potential has always been perhaps underestimated, but I have always been a lot, having a lot of faith in the energy of the youth. Last year, I think we have three or four delegations going from New South Wales to India, focusing on the agrotech, cybersecurity, and one was a mixed delegation. And all of them returned with very excellent results. So a lot of opportunities, you know, for some of the cutting edge technology being developed here to be commercialized in India and maybe for the government flagship programs like the Smart Cities or the Namami Gange or the Ayushman Bharat. So these are some of the important things we really look into. IT space, we continue to do well, but probably we need to take it to the next higher notch, you know, focusing a lot more on the data analytics, artificial intelligence, cloud computing because Indian companies are also scaling up. So obviously these are the opportunities, both sides, you know, we can, we should continue to explore and strengthen as we move forward. And lastly, you know, a little bit on the institutional issues, post RCEP environment, as Julian, you have referred, probably there's also a chance to look into the SICA, the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement for which discussions were shared because this RCEP came into being. And certainly we, especially part of the policy framework, you know, we need to really re-energize our sister-state relationship. For instance, in New South Wales, we have the relationship with Gujarat and Maharashtra, but probably we, we can really focus on it a lot more. And I think this will deliver a very rich division. And lastly, my message for the industry. I think a little bit of hand-holding is needed. And it is needed by the industry. We need to go beyond the government, whether Indian investments come here or the Australian investments go into India. Invest India 
MD and CEO is here, I would personally request him to look into this matter, especially for the newer investments. We should have a time frame and dedicate window to do the handholding to ensure the people don't face too many of regulatory issues, regulatory issues both ways. So I wish everybody here all the very best. Well, always the message is, you know, from both sides, whenever we talk, we play a lot of cricket. So Indian market is not about playing a T20 match. It's about playing long cricket innings, test innings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Manish. And what a, what a good introduction to Deepak Kapla, the Managing Director and CEO of Invest India. And of course, we're really pleased to have you here, uh, Deepak as Invest India is the national investment promotion and facilitation agency promoted by the government of India. So over to you, uh, Deepak. Thank you very much. It's uh, truly a pleasure. Thank you for you. Uh, Manish, you mentioned about the handholding. I promise you and I commit to you personally. In fact, we have a dedicated team here and Preeti, you spoke about the partnership. It's a commitment from my side. We have a dedicated team which is working only for Australia. I have my senior colleagues, Sai Sudhat, and the entire team anytime, 24 7, and we have to make this relationship stronger. Jim, so good to see you after a while. You look the same as you did just a few years ago, as distinguished as ever. <laughs> and truly a pleasure again. Hi, Julian. What I thought is I'll do, I've got five minutes, I know. Uh, we are on day 58 of the lockdown. And you know the life has changed in everything. So let me just give you a quick update of what has happened in the past 58 days. And why I'm stressing on this, because the world has changed in these 58 days. So let me just share with you my experiences of a new world order coming out. One is two learnings which I found myself, and you know I'm not been too old, as old in the government as Manish has been. I've just been here for the past six years. Two amazing things of what we learned in the past 48 days, my personal experiences. One is the most unprecedented lockdown in human history. 1.3 billion people, no playbook, no precedents, and the nature of this virus, that small little thing changing by the day. That means you needed agility, you needed a nimble entity, you needed responsiveness. And we all agree that what the WHO director had said on the 23rd of March, that the future of this pandemic depends on how India deals with it. I think everybody is fairly okay on the same side. That our ability so far, in kind, been able to flatten that curve and deal with it well so far. Fingers crossed. That's the first part. To show the responsiveness of a system. And the other element of the system at this time of the government was that places where we are committed to the world as an essential service, you would know over 70% of the world's financial transactions, for example, are executed out of India. We kept those businesses open, uninterrupted. Even though it was the biggest of challenges, we kept it on so that the world could carry on their businesses. And I'm not talking about just giving HCQ tablets to 123 countries and supplying and being the pharmacy of the world. That is one side. The second element which came out and which was very interesting for me and my team, and by the way, what I would urge everyone here to do, and I really mean it, please go on to our website, investindia.gov.in, and on that, there's a business immunity platform. We started a new platform, which was only for COVID-19. It was started just 30 hours before the lockdown. Go through the daily reports on that, and you will see how this pandemic has moved across the 58 days and what has happened and how the government has responded. It's very interesting. The most interesting thing for me, which has come out of the private sector and the government together, apart from just the partnership and how all the elements have worked together, is the ability of Indian business, and Manish mentioned about it, Indian startups especially, to innovate and pivot their businesses. Remember on day one of the lockdown, I did not have a single PPE in India being manufactured. Day 35, I have today the capability where I'm buying 300,000 PPEs in India every day. Companies overnight change their business models. We had a hosiery company making masks. We had an automobile company making ventilators. 
and all these being done in a all short period. Done in a short this ability to be nimble, this ability to pivot businesses is what is going to be the foundation and the foundation of the new world order, which is where we step into. That takes me to my next point. For us, this pandemic has brought one of the biggest opportunities where we are laying the foundation of New India. Manish spoke of the startup. Manish spoke of the innovation, that frugal innovation where we're coming together. And this is where you and us need to partner together, not just for the people of Australia and India, but to get solutions together for the entire world. And there are a significant number of new businesses that, and I will talk on that later, just to pick up on what Manish has already pointed out. The second thing, and this was very important, Manish, when you spoke about the handholding. You know, to position ourselves for the new world order and for the new opportunity standing out there, what I have found is happening in the past 58 days. The first thing which has come for globally is the point of diversifying risk. We were all taught that in our financial world, but now it is staring at everyone in the face. And what I've seen now in the past 34 days, especially, the number of business queries which are coming to us that please tell us where we can get the land, how can we just move our existing operational capacity and to do it fast. Those numbers have increased exponentially. In fact, the team hasn't had a chance to rest for seven during this period. And these are global requests. So what I'm seeing as a big trend is that COVID has actually been the catalyst which has hastened the decision-making trend where countries and companies are looking at diversifying their existing operating capabilities and onshoring of supply chains. And I think that is where India sits very favorably, as we all know, so I will not take it further on that. But the most important thing which has happened, Manish, and I go back to what you said about the handbook, and Jim, it takes back to our conversation, which we had two years ago when we were in our office, about the handholding in India. Unprecedented steps have been announced by the government in the past 14 days, starting from unprecedented labor reform to we were speaking about ease of doing business. In the ease of doing business, the government has already announced that there'll be a single window which they are going to play with an empowered task force for clearing all proposals on a fast track basis. Invest India will be hand holding that entire process. But you know what's most interesting? That where 80% of our hand holding happens is in the state government. And today I have state governments which have come up with single windows with deemed clearance. I have a state government which is set up, not here from us, days. everything is deemed cleared. And it doesn't stop there. They've actually taken it to the next step where they are willing to penalize the government official who has delayed it from his personal account. There is a new India which is already there. And the other element of that, if I look at the land bit of it, we've already identified land banks. We'll be putting them all on a portal where you sitting in Australia will be able to see directly to the GPS, the land plot available in whichever state they want to go to. That is where the land is concerned and also it's an approval part of that. Labor I've already spoken to you about. Number of labor, landmark labor reforms have been announced in the past 14, 15 days by the state government. Please see that and you will see that moving across multiple other state governments. On liquidity, I think you have the super funds. I have banks which are willing to fund any viable good project. They are sitting on that liquidity today. And on the ease of doing business and regulations, in every aspect of it, we are ourselves to global levels. In fact, I must tell you, you've heard of the ease of doing business. Our movement from the 140s to the 60s itself, let me tell you what went behind it. The state government, the central governments together did over 13,500 policy to help us move within that. That is how fast India is moving and that is how fast is changing. Let me very quickly now take you through what is the status of our relation. Invest India itself has managed 180 business requests from Australia across 31 sectors. 11 of these are on active basis, which are looking at an indicated investment of about $3.6 billion. 
Let me quickly run through the sectors. Which are there. The interesting thing is there are 31 sectors and the sectors which I run through quickly, Manish mentioned some of them. Tourism, metals and mining, again, a very big one. Food processing, a big one again. Auto. Infrastructure, which includes construction and a number of your funds have been looking at operating road assets in India, which is again a huge opportunity. Energy, construction I've already mentioned. Manish mentioned IT. We need to build up on that both sides. You know what's interesting? Media, leather, textiles. These are again sectors where I'm seeing interest coming in. Again, set of interest. EV, healthcare, retail, e-commerce. But the new sectors which are now going to come up post-COVID are in the new world order are going to be the new pharmaceutical sector. The new telemedicine sector, the distant learning sectors, they're going to be a huge element of interest, which I'm already seeing in these sectors. Frankly, if you ask me, what is it which creates business partnerships? It's trust. It's a government to government bond. It's a people to people bond. And it's a people to people bond. In my analysis, there are not too many relationships which we have, which have a take on all three. Frankly, we are nowhere close to the potential of where this relationship can take. I've just left a few thoughts with you. The team is there for you 24-7. We will work with you on the opportunities both ways. We will show you where it is going to happen. There's a new world order sitting out there. And let's make that happen for our people together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, really appreciate it. And what a good leading to Michael Sharp from our advanced uh, manufacturing growth center. And just can I ask now, um, Michael, who is also the uh, director of New South for New South Wales, and he has vast industrial experience. What to you, Michael? Uh, the Make It in India campaign is a great initiative. Uh, there's never been a better time for manufacturing than right now. Uh, we've been seeing Australia's great manufacturers come together uh, for the COVID-19 response. Uh, our organisation at AMGC is growing very quickly. We've had over 2,500 companies register their capabilities in response to the current crisis. Um, the ability for global supply chains uh, and the ability for countries to work together is fantastic right now. And I know the relationships between our two great countries, India and Australia, can only benefit from this fantastic opportunity for growth. Uh, I wanted to share some examples. We already have a company in Victoria called Sutton Tools who have operations in India. A long established family business been around for many decades, uh, producing uh, tools and drill bits. Uh, World-class design, uh, and manufacturing capabilities in Australia and India. Uh, this is a great example of how um, collaboration is a key driver for manufacturing and advanced manufacturing is only escalating uh, with industry four technologies around the digital transformation. We're seeing that uh, come to the fore right now. Uh, I really look forward to working with uh, the chapter uh, and seeing what we can do to grow the relationships around Australia and between Australian and Indian uh, corporations. So we look forward to working together with you. Uh, we look forward to introducing our members uh, to your uh, diaspora and seeing what we can achieve together. There's never been a better time. Thank you very much. Can I move to uh, Manish Singhala, Deputy Secretary General of FIKI? Manish, over to you. It's terrific okay. to have you here. And we value our relationship with India, DC. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, everybody in Australia. Uh, Jim, thanks for putting me here. Uh, and nice to reconnect with Manish Ji. We were in touch while he was in Delhi. Uh, nice to connect with Preeti. And of course, all the fellow panelists, including, uh, if I can say, my former colleague, Deepak Bagla. <laughs> The, uh, you know, today's discussion of course, is more on the new outlook for manufacturing sector. So 
I thought I must start by quoting that, you know, recently on 12th May, our Prime Minister talked of a self-reliant India movement. Now, of course, I would say that we should not make any mistake whatsoever that this does not mean an inward-looking India. So, uh, going on, on, on that tone, I think, uh, you know, some of the structural reforms, uh, almost eight major reforms, which Deepak's already uh, enumerated, I won't repeat them. But these have gone a long way in, in creating a forward-looking India, simplifying policies in India, and definitely with the objective of reviving growth post-COVID. You know, uh, uh, we, are, we are talking of liberalized investment limits, e-commerce, identifying a land bank, which again Deepak spoke of, and a lot of fiscal incentives. Now, this is something probably every government does uh, to attract investments. But something which, uh, uh, you know, a lot of sectors, Deepak also spoke of, something which India brings on the table is also that there is a huge uh, repository of raw materials. Yes, we may be buying a lot of coking coal from Australia or maybe uranium, but then uh, industrial raw materials are in abundance in India. We also have the largest technical and commercial uh, uh, human resource available in India. And also we bring in about a cost arbitrage when we look at the entire manufacturing value chain. So when manufacturing has emerged as a very high growth sector, uh, I think uh, we've done over the last 18, 19 years, almost $90 billion of investment in manufacturing itself. And probably uh, there is a long way to go still uh, considering that uh, manufacturing focus is only increasing in India. Of course, we are wanting to do it in a sustainable way. But also, I would like to talk about manufacturing because we have a very nice vision expressed by Mr. Peter Verghese in his India Economic Strategy 2035. However, that strategy does not look at manufacturing as a big opportunity in a very, very, very major way. Uh, this probably also comes from the fact that Australia's own manufacturing has shrunk, shrunk over the last 30 years uh, from almost 30% of GDP to 6%. And of course, other than expanding into uh, food processing and metals, machinery, equipment, and fabricated uh, uh, stuff, I think uh, in most of the cases, uh, Australian employment also is not there in manufacturing. Now, keeping all that in mind, uh, for a new outlook on manufacturing, India and Australia can look at probably two areas uh, of collaboration. Uh, not much has happened in these three areas, so I'm highlighting these. One is Industry 4.0, or say smart manufacturing. The second could be high technology manufacturing. We talk about and the third would be advanced manufacturing in medical technology and pharmaceuticals. Now, when we come to industry 4.0, we are looking at a convergence between manufacturing, supply chain, logistics, automation, digitization. Uh, and considering that India has spent not only in manufacturing and conventional manufacturing, but also in IT and artificial intelligence, that makes it a very deadly destination for industry 4.0. And Australia, on the other hand, has uh, high-level technologies in this area uh, 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 where then uh, we can always explore partnerships. I may mention here that government's already started an initiative called Samar Tudyog, which is which is Indianized and uh, called Bharat 4.0. This entails smart manufacturing and rapid transformation using Industry 4.0 technologies. And we set a target of uh, making India as a hub by 2025 there. This would run across industry segments, whether it's energy, large, medium, or small industry. Uh, I find that PICI itself, we launched a 4.0 initiative. We have a separate task force which works on it to look at collaborations between industry and other stakeholders in the industry 4.0 space. And we can, uh, you know, uh, take this in whatever way possible. Coming to high technology manufacturing, uh, 
uh, you know, there is something informally called as Make in India 2.0, which looks at high technology areas of areas of cooperation. And, uh, this is where uh, our competitiveness, cost, speed, innovation, and even quality would come into picture. So that's one area in high technology. You know, Australia has a great advantage in areas like editing, manufacturing, 3D printing, robotics automation, advanced materials, and of course, artificial intelligence and nanotechnology, et cetera. Uh, so these are the areas where, again, India can collaborate, not only in terms of uh, manufacturing here, but also expanding the r and out here and marry the Australian strengths with Indian strengths of being able to scale up and being able to supply to the world. And of course, I may highlight here that the market by itself is a big market for whatever is produced in India. Last, I had mentioned about advanced manufacturing. This largely relates to, uh, you know, uh, a lot of Australian imports of medicines. And Australia typically comes at the, at the fag end of the long, long global supply chain in the pharma sector. India, you all know, is a world leader in the pharma, especially generics. Uh, uh, out of the top 20 generic companies, data from India. So with deep technical expertise and innovative processes, uh, you know, Australia is very well positioned to partner with India to actually collapse this whole supply chain and collaborate with India pharma manufacturers. Now we are going to focus on APIs and uh, uh, ingredients so with that uh, it would be much better for australian companies to collaborate with indian companies for formulations uh, and all sites of medicines especially when it comes to also biotechnology and uh, uh, medical technology so medical technology is another area where australia is very advanced and india is a large uh, user of medical technology and we are, we are having to see the different so before I conclude, I mean, I would just say that uh, uh, something which Deepak also mentioned about Australian superfans, so far they've been in fact, uh, investing largely in infrastructure. Uh, probably uh, investment opportunities in Indian manufacturing, especially South Indian is the way to go. Uh, with these words, I would end and also like to want all my Australian guests here to keep in mind that last three decades with China's uh, next three would be India's so you know that's the way to go uh, thank you thank you so much thank you very much and what a what a good lead into one of our great success stories in Victoria and Australia and that of course is MedSurge Healthcare which was founded in 2007 by Cam and Money, and their company is also a sponsor for today's event so I really appreciate two things in one hit. The great success, they've gone for a broad range of specialized life-saving and niche methods to hospital and retail pharmacies across Australia, New Zealand, and throughout the Asia Pacific region. So without further ado, let me call on Cam and Reith to share with us their perspective. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. I will start with the video. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the introduction. It's great to be speaking with all of you today. 
I'm really thrilled to share uh, my success story uh, of a business which started right here in Australia and it's growing not only in Australia but also in India as well as globally. As you can see, Metsage was founded in 2007 um, with a view of we value life, effectively meaning saving people's life, patients' life by providing right medication to a patient at right time. In just 10 years, not only we have turned a startup company into a medium to large enterprise in Australia, but we have successfully able to expand our reach in manufacturing and products we believe in. History-wise, in 2019 was our milestone year when Metsage acquired a manufacturing site in India. Metsage was found in 2007, headquartered in Melbourne, Australia. We have a facility which is Department of Health approved. We are one of the fastest growing pharma pharmaceutical company in Australia. Uh, we have acquired, we have been accredited 9,000 ISO 9005 2015 in last year. The number of employees in Metsage is approximately 40 people on board. Um, currently, Metsage is uh, providing pharmaceuticals to 6,500 pharmacies approximately nationally and about 1,000 hospitals pharmacies. In 2019, Metsage acquired a manufacturing facility which is a sterile injectable facility in India, in Bangalore. It's an active manufacturing site spread across five acres of land in Hosu, Tamil Nadu, which is outskirts of Bangalore. We have R&D facility on site. It is, it is approved by US FDA. Currently, we are manufacturing pharmaceuticals for UK, Europe, Australia, Canada, and USA. The number of employees in our site is approximately 500 people on board. I'd like to share with you um, the pharmaceutical manufacturing at a glance where how the economy wise, the number wise, how um, the spending on pharmaceuticals here, but also global stage. The current spending on pharmaceuticals, as you know, is about 1.03 trillion USD as per 2019 data. And in that figure, Australia is spending close to $12.6 billion. 80% of that is goes through PBS. It has been projected by the economics in 2023 that global economy spending on the pharmaceuticals will be around $1.57 trillion, which leads to Australia to close to $16 billion. So there's a growth year by year, uh, every year from here onwards until 2023, we'll be seeing a $16 billion spending on pharmaceuticals. So clearly it shows that there is a potential for India and Australia to work together and mitigate this gap. Currently, India is supplying pharmaceuticals to Australia worth about close to $302 million. However, I can see that with COVID-19 in place, this number will continue to rise and there's a potential for both markets. Obviously, manufacturing in India has, the, has an infrastructure and capability. However, manufacturing in Australia, we all know there's current challenges, but there are future plans in place. So what's planned for Metsage? So Mets moving forward. Metsage would like to have a, um, a research and development site for niche and highly specialized pharmaceuticals in Australia. We want to be an innovative company. Uh, we want to bring efficiency to our healthcare professionals. Obviously, we, produce we will produce goods in India, but our research and development can be done here. Getting products from India, not only it gives a, a infrastructure there, but also it's a lot easier to source products from uh, India due to a supply chain. Getting products from Europe always been a challenging, the time lag, however, India will fill that gap. So our plan is to continue invest in India uh, for manufacturing and expand our Australian business by continuous research and development, create jobs for Victoria. We can see that's definitely a win-win for both countries. Then I'd like to hand over to my co-partner and director of uh, MedSearch, Reet, for to discuss about bilateral trade uh, between India and Australia. Thanks, Cam. Um, so first of all, thank you to ABC for this opportunity to speak on a subject which is the pillar of our business model, and India and Australia bilateral relations. 
So I will highlight some of the questions which thinking of like what will happen post COVID-19? What is the future of manufacturing and pharmaceutical specialty? So the first thing which I was interested in is that it has been invested in India. The main spurring factors which actually inspired us to invest in India were export the generic pharmaceutical technological capabilities and export capability which India has to offer. And working with Indian market has always been a reward for us because we are growing the collaboration between India and what our business here in Australia. So I believe India can offer a huge opportunity to expand, especially in pharmaceutical manufacturing. The other thing which I will actually highlight is that after COVID-19, the global manufacturing industry is at a verge of major. So we believe India can definitely become a best partner for Australia because India can offer manufacturing in India is a cost competitive environment due to ample and it has obviously obviously offered availability of raw materials, cheaper production, cost and labor. And secondly, we think is in a partnership which will have research and development done in Australia and of course partnership. Just a few days ago, our Prime Minister Scott Morrison identified as an Asia partners, and the two nations are likely to cement new. So, as a representative of the pharmaceutical industry, we aim to push this agenda strongly and consistently. Just to conclude, in the end, with our manufacturing site in India and our core operations here in Australia, we are looking forward to building our strength by using best of both countries. We are steadily working towards developing an R&D facility here in Australia, work with many local universities here in the near future. This will create definitely more jobs in Victoria and will produce future opportunities for local employment and innovation. So the future manufacturing depends on operating seamlessly between these two channels. So we think that co-create, co-innovate and co-produce should be the way looking forward to Australia-India relationships in the manufacturing sector. As Metzard's story is, a, is just a small example that how an Australian-owned, an Australian-owned company has expanded here, created a best environment here for Australia and Victoria. And now that we have we want to expand our portfolio and use the best things for both countries. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a great story and, and well done. It's a really good exemplar for uh, not just Victoria, for the whole of Australia. So, and a good example of making India and adding value to both India, uh, Victoria and Australia. And I think that's a very important message for our governments. Let me then move to Claire. Claire, of course, is the uh, International Engagement Manager for Standards Australia. So, uh, Claire, if you'd like to come on and share with us uh, your perspective. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. I don't know if you can see me, but I'll persevere. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. It's a great honour to speak in this group and hear all of the really interesting perspectives this, tonight. Um, and I really want to pass on my congratulations on today's launch as well. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Hoburn and I'm International Engagement Manager here at Standards Australia. Before I speak more broadly on the support for manufacturing, the manufacturing sector, I just want to set the scene on international standards. So a key statistic from the OECD is that up to 80% of international trade is impacted by standards and related technical regulations. So standards are really critical to ensure that processes, products and services are fit for purpose and support interoperability. They contain world-class specifications and best practice for quality, safety and efficiency that bring trust and peace of mind. As such, international standards support global trade, helping to drive inclusive and equitable economic growth, advance innovation, promote health and safety and help to create a sustainable world. So a little bit of background on Standards Australia. We are an independent, not-for-profit and non-government organisation formed in 1922. So we're almost 100 years old. Um, we're recognised as the peak national standards body in Australia and we have the responsibility of representing Australia and Australian interests at the International Organisation for Standardisation, ISO, and the International Electrotechnical Commission, IEC. 
We're a member-based organisation and our work schedule is very much driven by Australian stakeholders. Um, by being a trusted partner of government, industry and the community, we're able to support and provide for the Australian public, including where we can support increased international travel. So as mentioned, we are the Australian representative to the major international standards organisations, including ISO and IEC. We're also a member of the Pacific Area Standards Congress, which is a regional forum on collaboration. I also just want to take this moment to introduce and acknowledge our counterpart in India, the Bureau of Indi Indian Standards. So BIS is also a member of ISO and IEC and of PASC, and we work really, really closely with our colleagues from India across many technical issues and across a lot of the sectors that we've discussed here already tonight. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with standards development, a really key concept to grasp is consensus. So the strength of a standard is very much in the process taken to explore and debate all the views from different stakeholders and come to that agreement on minimum standards and best practice. This involves a lot of contribution from industry groups, government, consumers and other stakeholders, and certainly the manufacturers of products themselves. Looking at a bit of a snapshot of the standards catalogues from both Australia and India, we can see that India has a lot of standards, so over 20,000. And in Standards Australia, we have published about over 5,000 standards. So these standards are across all sectors of the economy. And, but what really matters, particularly for exporters, is identifying where some of those standards are actually aligned and where we have harmonisation. And then also where we might have standards in place that could cause a technical barrier to trade. So we've done some work with countries in the past, such as Indonesia, to map standards on a bilateral level. And that's work that we're currently planning to undertake with India so that we can really identify where there are those trade um, opportunities and barriers. And hopefully we can provide that information to exporters to have a really clear guide on how standards can best support them. And then also, because we are a, a, an organisation that is driven by industry, um, Standards Australia can then work with stakeholders to identify that where there might be a barrier from a standard and work on resolving that so that we can support trade more in the future. So in terms of manufacturing, standards play a really important role in the sector, particularly when it comes to quality assurance and product safety. This is particularly important when trading across borders. Um, when, the, when the use of harmonised international standards play a key role in providing trust in supply chains. This is particularly true now in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, where manufacturing is very much on the front line of the response to the pandemic. And areas like medical, personal protective equipment, um, product requirements for things like face masks, and also looking at standards around business preparedness and business continuity are really coming to the fore and are becoming a real important part of the conversation. So COVID-19 is very much changing industries, and we've heard that from some of our other panelists tonight as well. And Santa's Australia is really keen to support that change wherever possible. So to support that, we have released a standards and conformity assessment directory for the purpose of supporting this change. And the directory sets out the relevant standards, international and Australian standards, and includes information also on how and where you need to go to get those products tested and accredited. So finding the relevant standards, testing and certification capabilities might be a challenge for businesses, but it's the focus of this new directory. And it might be a useful model that we can then take forward in the future and consider in other manufacturing as well. Our focus is very much on making sure our standards are relevant and can respond to industry needs and very much in providing that right information to manufacturers when it's needed. Um, so yeah, as I said before, it's a great honour to present to this group and I'd be really keen to hear more from you all after the session. Um, my contact details are on our website and I'd be really keen to speak to you all again. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. And um, I wanted to say that the AIBC is going to announce more sessions for business to, to business and business to government interactions. And uh, I'm really looking forward that the Make in India chapters will also be launched in other states, including uh, New South Wales, South Australia, Queensland and Western Australia, particularly during these coming months to encourage Australian businesses to seriously engage in trade and investment with India. That as we conclude this panel, if you could give me three words, just three words, not more than that, on one of the take home messages from today's uh, webinar. So let me start with you, Preeti. Three words. Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jim. Uh, potential commitment and smart manufacturing. Excellent. Vish, what are your three words? Uh, perseverance, participation, and planning. Excellent. 
Julian? Three words? Yes, I'm still here. Uh, opportunity, collaboration, post. Excellent. Thanks a lot. The Honourable Manish Gupta, your three words? Patience, perseverance, and the potential. Very good. I know what patience means. <laughs> so, Invest India, Honourable Deepak Bhakta, your three words. So I'm taking all what the others have said and I'm adding three to it. Time to act. Ah, very good. Very good. I like that. Cam and Reith, what are your three words? You can take first first start with you, Reith. I will say on behalf of Jack, Cam as well, so it's together from us. Okay. Co-create, co-innovate, and co-produce. Very good. How about Claire? Your three words? Yes, thank you. I would say innovation, collaboration, and partnership. Excellent. Ah, Manish, here, yeah, over here. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll come straight to action after all this uh, qualification. Uh, let's look at high technology manufacturing as the area to go. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so can I conclude short and sharp? I want to thank each of our panelists today. It has been a challenging uh, uh, panel, but you've done really well, very well. And I appreciate the participation from India at the very top level from Invest India. And of course, Vicky, uh, you know, it's, it's really a very important partnership for us. And I acknowledge uh, your Australian support here with Jasmeet Singh and Nick Sarapathy. And of course, all our AIBC and FIKI members listening to this, uh, um, this webinar, our Victorian chapter. And can I especially thank our event sponsor, MedSurge. I think not just a sponsor, I mean, I think it's such a great success story that we, we have from them. And we need more of those history uh, in, in all our chapters. So MedSurge, Healthcare, our corporate sponsors, media, and all participants in Australia and overseas. And let me conclude at 6.15 on the dot. Thank you very much. Namaste. Yeah.